Welcome to the Lights Camera Pro Podcast, where we interview entertainment pros about their careers and how they became successful in the industry. The secrets to their success here every week. Here's your host, Sean Ventura. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Lights Camera Pro Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Ventura, and I just want to say go to Apple Podcasts and Spotify and subscribe, rate, and review. Today's guest is Ashley King, a podcaster from the UK and a creative director. She talks about her three podcasts, her creative consultancy, and her Learn to Podcast online course. It's going to be fun. She's got lots of stories. She's got lots going on. Here we go. All right. We are live on YouTube. I'm here with Ashley King. Hey, Ashley. Hello, Sean. How are you? I'm doing great. Um, it's so cool. You're you're in London, but you're like in the suburbs. What's the name of your town? I'm actually not anywhere near London. So okay. I'm in Newcastle upon Tyne, which okay. is in the northeast of England. It's okay. known for being like a party city. Um, that it, it's also got beautiful buildings and architecture. But uh, if you've heard of the show Geordie Shore, that is where I I live. Okay, in Newcastle. So yes, I've yeah. definitely heard of Newcastle. Yeah. Cool. And you're a podcaster and an entrepreneur and um, you have several podcasts and you also have your own creative production company. What you tell us about it. Yeah. So I, I am an entrepreneur. So I have my own business called Days Like This Are Sweet. It's a bit of a mouthful, but yeah. it's my um, creative production company. So I work with artists and creatives from all walks of life. Life. And usually it will be stilt walkers and circus dancers and, you know, uh, visual artists and it will be festivals and, you know, just very visual um, artistic pieces that we'll create together. Mm-hmm. So I have a TEDx specific Newcastle University podcast that's only infrequent, frequent, maybe it'll probably be two year that I'll release. Okay. Early, so there's only one of those at the moment. And the thing that really lights me up is Nurture Your Zest, which is my podcast. So that's about stories of overcoming adversity, um, how through curiosity, courage, and creativity, you can um, find your inspiration and nurture your zest. So that's my main podcast, and it's recorded in a professional studio. And then in the lockdown, I've created something called 100 Conversations, where I'm having conversations with people all over the world. Um, from home like this Mm -hmm. so that's called 100 conversations so yeah so i've got four podcasts um but it's just so nice to be able to have different interests and almost have a filter or a place to put them yes yes so do you have to have four different websites for all the different podcasts or or do you just have one website for all the podcasts so I have actually three websites. The reason being, so TEDx Newcastle University has its own website already. Mm. So I can just store the podcast on there and it's relevant to that. Um, with MBA with Ash, it also has its own website um, because it's specifically relating to, um, you know, uh, studying a master's in business administration. It's mm-hmm. not going to appeal to everyone. Right. And then Nurture Your Zest, because the 100 conversations element that is chats at home, but it's the same thing I would do in the studio. So that would both feature on my my usual Nurture Your Zest uh, website. But the good thing is, um, you know, I'm a podcaster and I also teach other people how to podcast. And what I do is on my website, I have a guest appearances page. So all of those other podcasts will appear on that guest appearances page anyway to direct people to the other sites. Okay. And then... Something that's really interesting for anyone who's listening who maybe is thinking of starting a podcast or has one is there is a site called Podchaser, yep. which I love. And Podchaser allows you to get credits for the, the podcasts you are involved in. So, you know, if you're a, a producer of one or a host of another, or if you, you know, I'm really, um, I really like to credit my guests who work on my podcast, not work, sorry, who, who come on as guests, mm-hmm. but also the the people who work on it. So if I'm outsourcing some editing, for example, I really like to make sure that my editors get the credit they deserve for working on that podcast. And Podchase is a great way to facilitate that. So yeah, I would highly recommend that as well if, if you're listening and you haven't checked it out yet. Yeah, I've heard of it. Um, so as you can see here, I'm using Ecamm Live. Um, 
for my podcast, but you use StreamYard? Yeah, so I do use StreamYard. And then what I would do is um, take the, the, the video and go and edit it for YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't stream directly to YouTube. I stream directly to Facebook just because of the level of engagement I get on Facebook is okay. pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, and then what I would do is I would take the audio file that I would get from StreamYard and turn that into an audio podcast I would put onto Spreaker. And then Spreaker distributes it to me to so many places just with a click of a button. Right. And I love that because it saves me time rather than sharing to Spotify and yes. Apple and uh, Google I and have all that. those places. Yeah, I have that with Libsyn. I have Libsyn and I go to 14 sites, 14 apps or sites. Yeah, at the That's same really time. That's really great. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting, actually, who uses what and what, you know, what yeah. the setup is. And it, it, it's kind of geeky, but I love all of that oh stuff. My God, I find it so, so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's very geeky. All right. So let's get started with the questions because I could talk to you all day. And that's why I'm doing this. I usually the Lights, Camera, Pro podcast, we usually interview directors and actors and writers and podcasters falls under that. I've interviewed a few podcasters, but like um, one woman, Katie Snyder, she was a life coach and a photographer and a podcaster. A lot, a lot of people do multiple things. But then I said, you know what? I'm just, I'm so interested in this podcasting thing. I'm just going to interview podcasters and ask them their story and how they got into it and what equipment they use and, you know, how they promote it and blah, blah, blah. So, so that's what we're going to do right now. So I'm just going to ask you, Ashley, how, like, what was the seed that said, I'm going to do a podcast? Were you a podcast fan? How did you get into it? Yeah, so I am a massive podcast fan. I love how you can listen to it, um, especially on, say, a walk to work. So mm -hmm. I live in the UK. Um, a lot of people walk to work, right? Um, it might be a 40-minute walk. It's a great way to refresh yourself in the morning and also just calm yourself after the day. So those are long walks. So you want to listen to something. So you could really access two podcasts a day or more, depending on the um, you know, the length of the, the person you like to listen to. I also like audiobooks a lot. So I just really engaged with that. You know, I think especially when you have someone's voice in your ears, but you don't know their face, it can be quite nice. You know, you, you just, you wonder what they look like. What are they doing? Where is their studio? You know, um, the accent it makes it really intriguing. So I've always been a fan of podcasts. Um, I think for me, when did the seed grow, so to speak? Uh, years ago, when I was around 18, 19, I did radio broadcasting, radio okay. journalism at university. Um, and actually, I loved that probably the most out of the whole course. When I was younger, I wanted to be a music journalist, you know, at music festivals. That didn't quite work out. Um, but I now do festivals in a different way where I'm creating the visual kind of experience for people coming mm -hmm. and watching. Um, so uh, in 2019, so just last year in May, I had been made redundant. I was a very brand new entrepreneur with a business mm -hmm. um, doing creative events. And I went to something in Newcastle upon time called uh, Newcastle Startup Week. And it's a festival for five days all about starting your own business or starting something new. And so I went to that and there was a guy called Tim Lezinski who had a podcast called Mind Your Business. And so he was speaking to people there on the day. And I featured in that, I think it was like five minutes max. But he asked me some questions about my business. And when I listened back, it's really not the best podcast ever. But I got so many people saying, wow, you've got such an interesting voice, such an interesting accent. I would love to listen to you. Like, please do a podcast. Mm. And so I thought about it. And the main thing that probably put me off is if I was going to do it, I would want to do it really well. Mm. So what I decided to do is save up some cash. And I actually, Tim, who had been the guy I'd been on his podcast, we came up with an agreement that I would be able to go into his professional studio and actually for a fifth of the price that I should be paying, um, I would pay that and he would, you know, partially sponsor me. And in return, you know, I would be putting out content every week, um, twice a week, sometimes more, sometimes every day. And in every podcast, you know, across all of my social channels, it says sponsored by TL Multimedia. So, you know, for him, it was a no brainer. And similarly, I set something up with a website branding expert and photographer. 
So I've got three organizations that are sponsoring me and I've still paid them for their services, but it's been right. able to allow me to get brilliant high quality material at much, you know, much less cost. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of how I was able to start. I think now that I'm, you know, say nine months into podcasting, I could have started way earlier, mm. you know, um, with a lot less. Yeah. But I'm also really happy with the way it all rolled out. I think it was right at the time. And I'm really glad that during the lockdown with the coronavirus and COVID-19, I've had the opportunity to learn how to do a lot of things for myself and actually realize how easy it is to live stream, you know, to mm -hmm. turn that into your own material and repurpose content. So, yeah, it's been an adventure. Um, but yeah, just started in um, in May last year as a guest. And then the podcast launched in September last year. Awesome. For Nurture Your Zest, how did you come up with the name? I met someone that I felt would really help me to bring that brand to life. I wanted it to be very strong. So Nurture Your Zest, we um, we did a game that I love called Wordplay. It's, it's basically going through a series of words. And I do this with a lot of my clients because I also teach, you know, personal branding, digital marketing strategies. It's part of my creative communications business. Um, but you know, really thinking what words light you up and what words do you absolutely hate. Right. So when I was looking at the words that lit me up, they were things like zingy, zesty, mm. um, zany, uh, curious, creative, courageous, brave, um, unusual, original, you know, words like that. And then the words that I really hated were things like clarity, focus, discipline, orderliness, mm. you know, yeah, very... Yeah, yeah very useful in many businesses and in you know it's an important trait for people to have but they're not me so i thought about a lot of different names i thought about um the word flamboyance i love the word flamboyance because i love flamingos <laughs> and so the collective <laughs> noun of a flamingo is a flamboyance of flamingos right. so I love that. But then when I kind of tested it with people, you know, when I said I'm thinking of starting a podcast called Flamboyance, they they felt it was very OTT. Um, I guess in the UK as well, you've got to remember that uh, they kind of, uh, people are a bit more shy and reserved in yeah. many ways, very polite. So I do find that a lot when I look at some of the US podcasters, they seem so much more brave than what we do in the UK sometimes. Right. Um, but yeah, flamboyance just wasn't really floating. Some people liked it. But then also I knew that I had all these amazing people straight away that I wanted to interview over 200 people and I'm working my way through them. Um, but they all had stories and the kind of collective thing that brought them together was they'd been through some sort of adversity mm -hmm. and um, they'd been stuck in some way. And that was how I felt. I'd felt stuck in a job several years ago where I was applying for so many different promotions and just getting, you know, rejected over and over. And I just felt like nobody could see me on my potential. And so the idea of no true zest is that you're stuck, right? But you can become unstuck and you can actually, through curiosity, creativity, and courage, you can find your inspiration and nurture your zest. So right. those were my key five words and they are all over my branding, all over my website, in all of my episodes. Um, and that's where the name came from is, you know, how do you nurture your zest? So that's a question that I ask every single podcast guest. And actually the audience has loved it because they can engage with that. So, you know, um, every, when, when we were able to before lockdown do live events or parties or whatever it might be, or if we were at somewhere where we had a stand and we were talking to people about the podcast, we would always have a little chalkboard and say, you know, how, what's your word for nurturing your zest? And they would write their word and get their snap. So it's, it's really been quite a powerful kind of almost like a movement in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was, um, I, I guess it was always intended that it would motivate and inspire people, but I didn't expect people to respond so well to it. Right. Um, but yeah, the name is great. I think as well, it's a quirky name. It's unusual. And the other thing is there was nothing like that online. So, uh, you know, when you search for a name, you know, going on Google, there's mm. so many podcasts. How do you stand out? Right. So no, your zest was a bit of a, a quirky, different one. Um, and that was 
that was kind of why I chose it. I should say that I love the name The Chatterbox Club because as a kid, I used to get in detention, uh, even age you know nine, uh, for talking in class all the time. And I had right. this really progressive headmistress and she was like... Uh, all the kids who were in detention were talking, she would put them in the chatterbox club and teach them debating skills and writing skills and how to, you know, communicate better. So it, they used those, um, I guess we were overusing our strength of talking in class, but they, they kind of put all that energy into something that helped us. But when you look at uh, the chatterbox club as a name, it's a name that's very utilized by um, the refugee community across the world. So there are podcasts about the chatterbox club that's to do with refugees, or there are like websites to do with that. And I just felt that was a platform that was important for somebody else rather than for me to come in and take that name. So that was the reason I chose to, to, to use a different name. And I'm really glad actually, because I think Nurture Your Zest fits me better. Yes. I think it's a very cool name. And um, I think like uh, cre as creatives, we're uh, incredibly brave because I've done stand up before, I've done acting before, and I have friends. I mean, it's so insane to do stand up, right? You're in a room alone by yourself telling jokes and people don't laugh a lot. Um, but we're, we're incredibly brave, but we're also incredibly sensitive. And it seems like a lot of the people that I've interviewed, they've had some sort of support, like a spouse, a sister, a friend who said, just do it, go for it. What are you waiting for? You know, and I love that message. And I love telling people that like online, I love commenting on people like, just do it, just make it, just create something. It doesn't matter if you make money. It doesn't matter if you're Joe Rogan or or Bill Simmons or something like that. Like just go and have your little 10 person audience and enjoy what you're doing and be creative because it's an outlet and, and you're making stuff. But obviously you've taken it a step further because you have your own company and you're creating events and all this kind of stuff. But um, how do you, I, I guess a question before I get to the other questions, how do you do it all? You have like four podcasts, a company, like do you sleep two hours a night? <laughs> That's a really good question. So I have to say it's been challenging at times doing my MBA. So it's it's a notoriously intense course to do a master's in business admin, whether you're at Harvard or INSEAD in France or, you know, studying in the UK, it's, it's an intense course for a reason. I think um, for me, I am better when I have a lot on my plate. So I get more done when I've got, you know, stuff to do. Um, I find it hard to motivate myself if I've just got loads of rambling free time, you know. Yeah. Um, MBA with Ash is a new podcast, so I've only released two episodes on that. I've got plenty of guests kind of waiting to go. Um, in terms of the 100 conversations, that's been done during lockdown, so it was a way I could continue my professional studio conversations. Right. And I think the reason I, de I decided to start a second podcast there is because I have very particular photography for my studio podcasts. So they, they're a very particular style. They're quite funky. There's people laughing or kind of looking a bit weird or, or just a bit different. So um, because we've done that in the studio, it would be a little bit difficult to try and create that with somebody's image that they just sent you through the, the web somehow. Um, so I wanted it to kind of have a clear distinction there. Um, TEDx Newcastle University, as I mentioned before, is always going to be on its own. So that doesn't, it's not onerous, but TEDx keeps me very busy. It's a fabulous project. I love it. It's, you know, I'm really passionate about TED and TEDx. I went to California in December last year um, for TED Women, which was amazing. The incredible creatives and women who were there and the podcasters who were there was just amazing as well. Um, so, yeah, I do think keeping busy is important. I would say podcasting, you mentioned about monetization and, you know, revenue generating podcasts. And you're right, there's so many people not making any money from podcasting, but the visibility that it brings you and the credibility that it brings you, I can't tell you how many copywriting jobs or, um, right. you know, uh, different things that I do, you know, PR jobs or um, different events that have come to me. Hey, Ashley, can you do this festival for us? Can you do that because of the credibility you have or because of the stuff that they see that you're putting out there, the content and the connections you have? The connections, so I think yeah. If you, 
Yeah, if you are really kind of, it's great to have lots of interests, but if they all flow into your, your goals and your values, then I think it's so much easier for people to know who you are and what you're about. So um, that, that's the compliment I get actually from my audience quite a lot is, you know, hey, I want to work with you because I listen to your podcast and I love what you're about. And that's really nice. Um, so, yeah, I definitely think it's, it's something about if you if you do stuff that lights you up, it feels like fun, doesn't feel like work. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, um, every conversation and I've, been, I've interviewed people that I've known for 20 years. Um, and, and they will tell me things I, I don't know about them, stories they don't, I don't know about them. Uh, but then just even yourself, but um, other people that I've interviewed, it's just they never cease to surprise me. And people are smarter and more interesting and more creative than I would ever expect them to be. You know what I mean? I'm always constantly surprised by people and and actually the amount of work that they do. I mean, people are just cranking out content and working on lots of different things. Um, human beings are very complex. They're not just like these one dimensional like, oh, I just work in a bank. That doesn't happen anymore, especially with creatives. How do you find your guests? Like I know there's a lot of people struggling for guests. I personally don't. Uh, because there's an unlimited amount of directors, actors, writers, and podcasters. But um, some people, when they do a very specific podcast, they're like, how do you find your guests? And how do you personally find your guests? Okay, so this is one I'm quite opinionated on. So um, (laughs) I'll try to be polite. (laughs) Okay. Um, Actually, I would say... I mean, I have no challenge finding guests because I've got a massive list. I have like a, a who's who lead list that I wrote before I even started. So before I started, I listed 200 people that I just wanted to speak to and have on my podcast. At the moment, I've only released um, around 45 podcasts all in all. So that's with mm-hmm. all of the four there. Right. Um, so th- I'm nowhere near that 200, right? And all of those people had a similar thing in common. They all creatives. They often have been through something like, uh, you know, on my podcast, we've talked about divorce or suicide or overcoming some sort of challenge. Mm-hmm. You know, it could be um, coming from a poor background and, you know, working super hard to, to become a CEO or whatever it might be. Um, but they all have a, a similar story. So it's very much links back to the value. So I feel like guest is not an issue for me because I've got that long list and I'm working through it. What I struggle more with is I feel like on a daily basis, I get around 30 uh, direct messages on LinkedIn. It's my most busy platform where I'll have people come to me and say, hey, I see you're a podcaster. I need to be on your show. Tends to be someone who's just released a book. And it's on a bit of a, um, you know, a books, a podcasting right, free to get to promote uh, loads of, yeah. yeah, exactly. And usually it's very like much a hard sell. So I'll then direct them to my website and I'll be like, look, here's my apply page. Tell me how you would, you know, I'd love to talk about having you on the show, but, um, you know, to make sure that this is the right fit for my audience. Can you tell me about a prickly situation in life you've overcome? You know, tell me how you nurture your zest. And then in many instances, I've had people fill in the form like, hey, uh, I need to sell my books. You know, here's my website, that kind of thing. So <laughs> it's, it's a great way for me to go, no thanks. No, you know? thank you. And, and as I said, I know that's quite a, a hard line, but I think when you are a, a content creator, you can't make content for everybody because it's just not going to work. It's going to fall flat on its face. You need to know exactly who you're wanting to reach because if you are making it for everyone, in my opinion, it just it falls flat, right? So I often will and will say, actually, you know what? Thank you so much for reaching out. Um, I don't think this is the right match for my show, you know? The people that you teach how to create a podcast, um, is that something they just purchase online what is it? So it's a very new thing, actually. Um, due to the lockdown, like many of us, you know, right. completely changed my business model, changed the way I do things. Yeah. What I found was um, a lot of people were contacting me right since I launched the podcast. Oh my gosh, you're so brave. How did you launch a podcast? 
please teach me, please help me. And so I was getting a lot of those messages. Again, LinkedIn is a great tool. It's what I use all the time. It's where I get all my sales, all my business from. So I I was just posting, hey, this is this week's podcast. And then I would get my inbox flooded every time. Um, so what I found is I needed a way to help those people who were constantly asking, but in a way that I wasn't doing it for free all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so I created a course. Um, I've, I've actually, we haven't properly released it yet. So it's okay. been beta tested at the moment. We've had people testing it out, but we've had 97 people going through that with me. So we've gone through everything like, um, you know, your branding coming up with your name. How do you, um, how do you choose your music? How do you choose, you know, what your podcast is all about? What are your values? What is your value system? Um, down to the technical stuff, you know, uh, distribution platforms, monetization, getting sponsors, how to host, um, how to deal with difficult guests, you know, how to ah, that's um, a good one. improve your guest experience, all of this stuff. So it's quite a broad thing. We've got five modules in it. Um, the way I like to work is I like to work with collaborators. You know, that's my the thing that lights me up. So I've got my branding um, sponsor who worked with me originally to, to create Nurture Your Zest has done the first module all about creativity and branding. And then a colleague of mine, Joel, is helping out as a technical person. So he's given us all of his technical expertise. And I could teach on that, but I just feel that it wouldn't be authentic or the best for my audience and for my learners to to teach on that. So it's quite nice, actually. It's come together really well. um, And I'm really looking forward to launching that, you know, out to the world. But at the moment, it's been so fun to hear what the 97 people testing it have thought. And, you know, we're shaping it and improving it every day. It's really fun. So I'm just curious, because I I didn't really understand. Is it like something that you click through? Or is it a video that you watch? How does it physically work? Yeah. Yeah, sure. It's it's like many other online courses that you can buy and access on demand at your own time. So it's a, a online platform called Simplero, uh, like Kajabi or Thinkific or mm-hmm. Teachable, all these different sites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like. I like Simplero because it gives you so much in that platform. You know, you don't have to use MailChimp or CRM systems. It's all there. If people buy the course, they get a, you know, a receipt straight away. They get the login details straight away and they can access it on demand. We then have a Facebook group for questions and community. And that's really great. It's nice to have a place that people just ask. And then we have spotlight calls, which are group calls um, where the spotlight is on a learner in the group. So it's about their idea, their podcast, and how together we can help them get it launched. Um, And then uh, there's also one-to-one coaching. So the one-to-one coaching is like obviously more expensive because they're getting private coaching with them. absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and they can choose then as well. So they can buy credits on the site I was telling you about Simplero, the platform. They could buy, say, five credits when they started or three and then use them at any time. So they could say, hey, I'd really like to spend my one hour credit with Joel going over some video editing stuff because I'm really stuck. And Joel will then help them with that. Or they might want to chat to me about um, something they stuck with. And those are private and they, you know, those calls are recorded for them, but they for them only. Whereas mm. the spotlight calls, the group coaching, that's very much recorded and put on the platform for everyone to see. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great way to just help people to share their ideas and, and um, help others to learn through watching those calls as well for those who are a bit nervous to do it themselves. Right. No, yeah, absolutely. So- it sounds great. And I know there's there's so many of them out there. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting thing. And I think some people just need a little more help because I uh, my profession is a, a video editor. I've worked in television and film for 25 years. And so for me to use Adobe Audition is not that far from Premiere. But some people are like, what is this editing thing? I have no audac- audacity or... Um, garage band or whatever. How do I do this? Um, so yeah, some people need a little bit extra help. So that's great. So I just have a couple of more things. I know you're the busiest woman in the UK. Sponsors and affiliates and all that kind of stuff. People are just asking a million questions all day long. And if you can just shed a little light on that, um, how do you do it? And what do you do? 
Yeah, so as I mentioned, I have three sponsors. Um, any podcast I release now, my sponsors still are the sponsors for that. So that's the agreement I've had with them. So even though I'm not in the professional studio right now, um, they are my chosen sponsors and I work with them. Um, I do still pay them, but it's, you know, say £120 for a hour for professional studio time, I might pay 15 or 20 pounds something like that right. so it's very 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 discounted for me you know I'm, I'm really fortunate in that um i think in terms of affiliates so i do have people guests who come on the show and i always offer them the opportunity if they're selling a book or if they are advertising a festival or whatever it might be that they could do you know win a pair of free tickets or something like that mm -hmm. i also usually set up a code with them so it's like might be zest because that's my podcast name you know right. so it might be zest 20 or zest 10 or whatever it might right. be um in terms of monetization for me the monetization usually comes through the course um or will do you know as that develops um in the UK, I think this is a really important point. I've noticed in the States, like people have no problem with ads and listening to ads on podcasts. But in the UK, it seems to be a real no-no. So in my entire oh, really? um, community around me, yeah, I don't know anybody who puts adverts on their podcasts. And I think that they're really missing out, right? Because it's what, a few seconds at the start or the end of the show or even sometimes during. I mean, I am giving advertising to the sponsors that I name in my show, mm -hmm. but um, it's not really a big thing in the UK where you might say, say you were doing something for a teeth whitening company and throughout your show, you mentioned them or something like that. That doesn't happen. So you might use Spreaker or a distribution site and you know feature a small snip of an advert that would probably be okay. Mm -hmm. But even that's like, whoa, what are you doing? So it's a really interesting cultural thing. Mm. I don't think the UK is quite caught up with that. They're the same when it comes to um, philanthropy, I think as well, you know, in terms of asking for donations. So I also uh, recently, uh, over the last sort of three, four months, have started using Patreon and mm -hmm. Kofi um, and kind of putting those links on my YouTube and putting them elsewhere. Um, and that's something I've had to build into my templates for every new episode release now that, you know, on every episode release, it'll say, hey, if you've really enjoyed this content, support me here. Right. So that's something that I would love to learn more about from the Americans, you know, ah. um, because I think that's something that's so developed, you know. Um, and also at some point, I'd love to do merchandise, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but then I'm thinking, who wants to wear a Nochi or Zest hoodie? I don't know. Maybe there are people out there who would I buy mean, one. If they but... love your show, they'll wear it. Uh, that's that's my experience is if the people love your show. I personally can't stand ads. Like the bigger ad, the, the bigger podcasts that I listen to, um, Dave Chang and Bill Simmons. I don't really listen to Joe Rogan. I'm just trying to think of an example of really big podcasts. They go on for like five minutes in the beginning of the show. And I'm like, please, you know, I'm just, you hit that little fast forward button. I can't stand it. I don't mind a 30 second or a 15 second, but it's too much. So I agree with people. I, I don't like the ads, but, um, as far as the Patreon and the Kofi and all that, I've, I've heard some things that, you know, it's okay, uh, but it's only going to be there if you're like hundreds of thousands of downloads. So, so let's just wrap it up. I know you're busy and you have a million pot, you have 47 podcasts to do. Um, let's just wrap it up with advice that you have for these people who need a nudge. I know and you can tell us again about your, your course, um, but any advice that you have for people want to get into it or just getting into it, um, what you've learned so far? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I would say um, be really clear on who you want to speak to. So I mentioned that earlier, but, you know, when you know who you want to reach, it's so much easier who you're going to choose, what content you'll feature, you know, who you're going to let on your show, what shows you'll go on as well. That's a really important one. Um, I think as well, just it helps with everything your content creation so in the course a lot of people came with a lot of fears you've, you've done all that cool stuff but the biggest fears that came up if it wasn't technical things were um 
what if people don't like my message? What if people think I'm too full of myself? What if people think, you know, my story's rubbish? What if I don't have enough content? What if it's just too hard? And so we had all of these fears. It was like, what if, what if, what if? And actually, um, it's about taking that, that, that first step, right. To just do it because Mm -hmm. I think it's so easy to feel overwhelmed. And I think a lot of people as well will say the podcasting industry, you know, it's so busy. There's so many podcasts. Why should I start a podcast? It's too late. I've missed the boat. And I think that is so silly because now is when people are listening to podcasts more than ever, you know, yes, because it's lockdown, but also because they, they now popular, right? So everyone knows about them. So you are more likely to get listeners than a few years ago where it was, you know, more of a kind of weird hobby to do, I guess, you know, as so. I think now is a great time to start a podcast, but do it for the right reasons. And the biggest tip I could give you is to record in advance. So you've got heaps of content because where I see people getting stuck is they'll record one episode or two episodes, get stuck in the editing and the technical stuff. And then they just never put anything out. So you'll, you'll see this quite a lot. You know, there's people who start a podcast, release one episode, another six months later, and then you don't hear from them for three years. And it's kind of like, what is going on with your content? You know, um, another, another last tip. Uh, so this is, this is a double tip Instagram. So when I started my Instagram account for my podcast, it was beautiful. And I had all these gorgeous tiles and I created this pattern that it would be like cactus quote, cactus Mm. quote person. And it was, it looked stunning. Right. But what I didn't realize is if you post too much in a go with Instagram, you can get blocked. So my Instagram has been blocked um, and it was blocked from Christmas till about February. And it's just one of those things I haven't had time to sort out yet. Mm. Um, So I would say keep everything as simple as you can and try not to like over... I think on that day, I'd probably posted 50 Instagram posts in one day because I was trying to catch up with my grid. Um, And actually, Instagram will block you because it'll feel like you're spamming people. So that's something that I didn't know about. Um, I also felt really hurt by another podcaster um, at one point because they chose the same guest as me for Christmas. So it was like the one time that you're ever going to have the same guest. Right. And what I would say there is sometimes you will have people in your local community or other podcasters, people will choose the same guests. Like it is not anything to worry about. You know, just just be open to um, making your show with your own stamp. And if you've done that, then people will know when they listen to whatever podcast it is, you'll have your take on things and other people will have their take on theirs. So that's my biggest uh, thing is try not to get worried about the comparison, about what this person's doing or that person's doing. Because if you're really secure in what you're doing and if you're serving your audience, right. then it doesn't. it's not as scary, right? Because you know that you're giving the best experience for them. I totally agree. Thank you so much for doing this, Ashley. Um, and if you want to tell us your website so people can go to it, especially if they want to see the course, but if they want to listen to your podcast or whatever. Yeah, sure. The The best place to, to find me is on the website, Nurture Your Zest. So it's www.nurtureyourzest.com. Um, on there, you can see various different uh, pages, you know, about the website with, uh, sorry, about the episode. So there's a listen area. There's also an apply area if you are interested in being a guest. Note, I do feature creatives from the technical sector, so tech sector, or, you know, who are who are creating things, visual artists, um, and people who've overcome adversity. So those are my kind of key things I focus on. Um, also, there is a learn to podcast section on the website. So you're welcome to go on there as well. Um, we're still kind of getting the course, you know, finalized. So we've got a waiting list at the moment, but I would love to share more details. If anyone's interested, you can just go on and, and join the waiting list and I can share that as soon as it's ready. Um, I think that's everything. Yeah, it's really nice to chat to you, Sean. I'd love to have you on Nurture Your Zest, actually, because you are a creative and just the type of person I like to feature. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we'll have to talk offline about that, but I would love to do it. Um, so thanks so much for doing this, Ashley. And I will be turning this into an audio podcast, too, and I'll let you know when that happens but uh is it 10 45 at night there wow okay 
So yes, yeah, it's forty-five. We haven't even had dinner yet. So <laughs> no, it was great to talk to you, and um, I will talk to you soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to the Lights Camera Pro Podcast, where entertainment pros talk about how they made their dream into a career. Go to Apple Podcasts and Spotify and subscribe, rate, and review. Thanks to Bob Jurgens for the rock and VO and Joseph McDade for the music. Next week, our guest is actress Amy Holler. She talks about studying with Burt Reynolds and also doing a film with him. She's a great actress. She has lots of stories. It's going to be fun. Check it out next week.